Hello and welcome. As usual, I've got no bloody idea what episode number this is. Might be 40 or something, 41. Anyway, welcome back to those who are returning and welcome if it's your first time here. In today's episode, I'm going to be looking at Dennis Rader, who's also known as the BTK killer, which stands for Bind, Torture, Kill. He murdered 10 people between 19... For the more sensitive listener... I must warn you that this episode does contain disturbing details about burglary, breaking and entering, uh, voyeurism, bondage, sadomasochism and raping and killing. So let's begin where I normally do then by looking at his childhood. He was the eldest of four boys. Those who knew him said that he was quiet but always joined in. He wasn't into sports and he preferred hunting and fishing type activities. People have said that he had a pretty unremarkable childhood and wasn't a neglected child. But Dennis Rader has said that his parents, who both worked, were distant and not interested in the children much. He said that he harbours resentment towards them. On the first point, I'd just like to point out something that people don't often acknowledge. It doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. It matters what the person saying it believes. His parents may not have been abusive and might have provided well for their family. But if Dennis felt a sense of abandonment and resented it, it's true for him and it's a starting point for forming negative relationships and associations. His parents both worked long hours and paid fairly little attention to the children at home. Rader later described feeling ignored by his mother in particular and resenting her for it. His childhood seemed fairly unremarkable. However, a district attorney in a documentary about him said that Rader had recalled his grandmother killing chickens and he was thrilled by that. A friend said that he participated and liked hunting and fishing, etc., He was quiet. Friends have said that he would hang turtles and kill stray animals. His schooling also seemed fairly unremarkable and is remembered as just being quiet. The same documentary that I've just mentioned also says that Rader was reprimanded by a teacher who humiliated him in front of the class. He went around to her house after and watched her presumably to do something as a form of revenge for the humiliation. He tied a rope around his waist and he had an orgasm aged 11 or 12 whilst watching her through the window. Rope and voyeurism was then associated with pleasure. By his mid-teens, he was undergoing changes that set him apart from the other boys. He was having sexual fantasies. By that time, he said that he knew his future. He knew what he was going to be, he said. He says that he tortured and killed animals as well as peeping at women through windows and stealing underwear. Yet, he came across as being somewhat normal to those who knew him. Rader served in the United States Air Force and went back to college and earned a bachelor's degree in administration of justice. Rader worked in several jobs and went on to marry and had two children. He was a Cub Scout leader and a president of the church council. So on the surface of things, he was living a normal suburban life and was respected within his community. Nobody, including his wife and children, suspected that he was capable of killing. I think that that's why this is such a popular case. He lived a secret life of voyeurism, bondage, rape and torture. We all like to think that we can spot a serial killer or at least spot signs that something isn't quite right with someone. But Dennis Rader didn't show any signs that indicated how evil he was. However, this is more prevalent than you might think. We all have different roles that we play out in different circumstances. You wouldn't look at a manager in an office and immediately see a tennis player or a golfer, do you? You see them as being a competent authority figure. Listening to this podcast now, you don't think of me as a motorcyclist, do you? But I am. You wouldn't look at a family man and see a rapist, but he might be. Commentary on this case always mentions his incredible ability to compartmentalise his life. 
But we all do that to some degree. When I'm researching a case, I don't think of myself as being a mother or as a caregiver at that particular time because I'm not doing activities that relate to those things at the time. Granted, in Dennis Rader's case, his activities were very extreme. But he was raping or killing women. He wasn't a father then. He wasn't being a father. He wasn't being a husband at those particular times. He was acting in ways that he found sexually pleasurable. The first murder that we know of was a family of four, two adults and two children. And this was the Otero family. The children were aged nine and 11. Raider expected the mother and the children to be home, but not the father. He cut the phone lines and he entered the house when the dog was let loose by one of the children. He held them all at gunpoint and tied them all up in a bedroom. Then he put a plastic bag over Joseph, the father, and cords around his neck. In the court manuscripts, he said, I tried to make Mr Otero as comfortable as I could. Apparently, he had a cracked rib from a car accident, so I had him put a pillow down for his head. He put a, I think, a parka or a coat underneath him. So Raider went into this house and he realised then that he'd have to kill them because they'd seen his face at that point. So he strangled Mr Otero, then Mrs Otero, then the two children. However, they'd only passed out and they regained consciousness and he strangled them again. When Josephine, the 11-year-old, regained consciousness, he took her to the basement, hung her, upside down and in his words had some sexual fantasies after she was hung. Now that crime scene sounds like a fairly chaotic scene. He left and he took the family's car. The next victim was Catherine Bright. Raider had entered her home but and hid by her bedroom waiting for her to come home. She and Kevin Bright came in. He wasn't expecting Kevin to be there. In court, Raider says how he told them that he was wanted in California and needed a car and money. And he says that he told the Oteros that. And as he puts it, he told them that to put them at ease. Raider tied them up using materials that he found there, telling the court that he would be dead if I'd brought my own stuff and used my own stuff. I'm not bragging on that. It's just a matter of fact. And this was because Kevin eventually managed to break free and run. However, he was shot a number of times during the struggle. They were tied up in different bedrooms and while strangling Catherine, he heard Kevin and he went back to strangle him. There was a bit of back and forth again between the strangling of each of them in separate rooms. Kevin got away and after Catherine fought back whilst being strangled, he also stabbed her because in his words, it, meaning strangulation, wasn't working. She was stabbed three times. After this, Raider says that he cleaned up, he took their car, but took the wrong keys out, so ended up running back to his car. His next victim was Shirley Vine. Raider claims that his victim was a random killing, and not the one that he'd actually planned to kill like he'd planned the others. He'd planned to kill someone else, but they didn't answer the door. As he'd been walking towards it, he'd stopped to talk to a young boy and asked if he could ID somebody in a photograph that he showed him and watched what house he went to. He called the murders projects and if one didn't turn out the way that he wanted, he simply moved on to another. On that day, he knocked at the boy's house saying that he was a private detective and he showed a picture of a boy to ask if they could ID him. He then forced his way in with a gun and told the woman that he had a problem with sexual fantasies and that he was going to tie her up. He tied the children up but said they got upset and he decided that this wasn't going to work so he locked them in the bathroom. He says that he put blankets and toys there to make them comfortable. Then he tied his victim up and she threw up on him so he got her a glass of water before putting a bag over her head and strangling her. He packed up what he calls his hit kit and then left. Next he killed Nancy Fox. He says that he would troll the area to identify possible targets and then start to stalk them to find out more about them. 
He said in court, the more I know about a person, the more comfortable I am with it. Again, he cut phone lines and he broke in and then waited for her to come home. As he'd done before, he told her that he had a sexual problem and he was going to tie her up and have sex with her. He said that she was a little upset and so they talked for a while and had a cigarette. She went to the bathroom and he told her to come out naked and then he handcuffed her, tied her feet and then strangled her first with a belt and then with pantyhose. Then he masturbated before getting dressed, cleaning everything up and then left. Maxine Hedge was the next victim to be killed. She lived nearby and she, he watched her coming and going. He went down to a bowling alley and he changed and took a taxi back to her house. He told the driver that he'd been drinking and he acted a little drunk and asked if he could be dropped off near to her house, which wasn't quite at his house. He saw her car there but wasn't expecting her to be home. He snuck into the house to find that she wasn't there and so he waited. She returned home with a man and so Raider hid and waited until the early hours in the morning before attacking. He flicked the lights on and he jumped on top of her, strangling her. Once she was dead, he put her naked body in the car and he took her to his church and took pictures of her in different forms of bondage. Finally, he drove and dumped her body. His final victim was Dolores Davis. He threw a concrete block through her window while she was home. He told her that he was wanted and needed food and warmth. He handcuffed her and told her that he would like to get food and he talked with her to calm her down. He pretended to go get food and a few things and acted like he was leaving when he went back and removed her handcuffs. He then tied her up and strangled her. After he killed her, he told the court that he had a, a commitment he had to attend and so he moved her to another location in his car and returned the car to her house. He threw her keys onto the roof of her house. He walked back to his car, retrieved her body and then took it and dumped it. Dennis Rader has already been given a diagnosis of narcissistic, antisocial and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. The psychologist reported that Rader has a grandiose sense of self, a belief that he's special and is therefore entitled to special treatment. A pathological need for attention and admiration, a preoccupation with maintaining rigid order and structure and a complete lack of empathy for his victims. He was a narcissistic psychopath, therefore he didn't see other people as having any rights. He thought of his own needs first and foremost. At this point, I wondered how a narcissistic psychopath who wasn't able to empathise with others could show such compassion to his victims. With Joseph Otero, he put a pillow down for his head and he had him put a Parker jacket or something underneath him. At Shirley Vine's house, he put the children in the bathroom with some food and toys and he gave her a glass of water after she was sick. He sat and he had a cigarette with Nancy Fox because she was upset. He told some of his victims that he was on the run or that he was going to rape them in order, in his words, to put them at ease. However, I don't believe he did these things because he cared about the victims or how they were feeling. It's likely that he did these things because he wanted to control the situation. He wanted things to go exactly as he'd planned and he wanted to be the one to inflict the pain and suffering. He would have married and had children because it gave him the front to carry out such atrocities. Psychopaths do have this remarkable ability to act in ways that are seen as normal. It then allows them to become hidden in plain sight. He had known from a young age that he was sexually deviant and he learned to cover it well. With Dennis Rader, the first thing that I noticed was that this was a man who wanted to be seen and noticed. This isn't necessarily a rare thing. Sometimes the worst thing you could do to a serial killer like this is not know who they are. When he knows he's caught, he has no problem recalling all of the murders. He tells the court details of each one with absolutely no emotion whatsoever. 
And this is because he didn't acknowledge the victims at all. They were simply objects for him to carry out acts that he found pleasurable. He prided himself on knowing where other serial killers had gone wrong. Straight after one murder, he went home to his wife. He sat at the breakfast table reading the paper about the killings and she said, oh, look at that, he misspells the same word as you do. And he says that I thought I was going to have to kill her right there and then, but she let it go. He wasn't ever capable of love. Any love that he showed towards people was simply an act. When the media reported that three men were under suspicion for the murders, he sent the first communication letter saying that more people will die. He was livid that somebody else was going to get credit for his work. He even telephoned the police to report the next murder. He was proud of his work. In his mind, he was finally being seen. He even suggested that he should be called BTK, as this was his signature way of killing. Bind, torture, kill. He was a sadist and he got pleasure from seeing the victims suffer. He wouldn't have wanted them to die quickly. In court, he said, if you know anything about serial killers, you know that they go through different phases. They go through the trolling stage where they look for their victims. You can be trolling people for years, but once you lock onto somebody, it becomes stalking. He wanted people to know what he'd done and that he'd done the research on this to show how well planned that they were. He took a great deal of pride through the whole process. The next kill he planned very, very well and he had an alibi all ready for that. He took his son on a Boy Scout night out and he got up at one in the morning, went and killed and then returned to the camp. He took her to the church already dead and he posed her in these different forms of bondage and took pictures and then he dumped her body on the roadside. He then stopped killing without ever being caught or ever coming under suspicion and after 25 years a newspaper ran a story on the murders. After reading it he sent the letter to the police. He started a cat and mouse game of posing cereal boxes with dolls posted in the area. He was playing games with the police. He placed items around the area and told media where to look for them. In one of these letters to the police, Raider shared disturbing details from his childhood that explained his motivations behind his brutal, sexually charged murders. Raider explained that as a boy, he would often view pornography, which he believed led him to develop violent fantasies as a teenager that involved sadomasochism, bondage and domination. By 18, Raider said that his fantasies had escalated into window peeping and stealing women's underwear. These progressions that we see over and over again with killers is a crucial step that moves them closer to killing somebody with each step. A person doesn't just wake up one morning and decide that they're going to go out and kill. They normally start with smaller deviant acts first, such as watching pornography, peeping through the windows. Then they move on to physical contact with a victim, such as entering properties without permission or rape. Each barrier is then overcame and that leads them on to the next and so on. During the period that he didn't kill, he turned his attention inwards to autoerotic fantasies. He'd dress himself up in women's clothing and in various forms of bondage poses and took pictures. During this, he would have drawn on his memories of killing to add to this pleasure. Therefore, it's very unsurprising that he was able to recall each murder in such detail. He would have recalled the memories of them hundreds of times before. Serial killers often take small items as trophies so that they can be used to relive their experience. During his game of playing cat and mouse, sending letters to the police and the media, Raider asked that if he were to put his writings on a floppy disk, could they be traced or not? The police answered his question in a newspaper ad in the way that they instructed, saying that it would be safe to use the disc. It was the metadata on that disc that led to his identification. Raider was so arrogant and had such feelings of grandiose that he fully expected the police to be honest with him. 
DNA had been obtained from one of his victims and the police had already matched that to DNA from his daughter to identify a family match. He was found guilty of 10 murders and at his court hearing he gave a rambling 30 minute long speech that has been likened to an awards acceptance speech. His statement has been described as an example of how psychopaths cannot understand the emotional content of language. He was sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences with a minimum of 175 years. That concludes it for today then. I do hope that you found this psychological analysis interesting. More importantly, as always, I hope that you learned something new from it. Thanks for listening then. Bye for now.